Hey guys, welcome to my video on ECG basics. We're going to run through some basic concepts related to the ECG. Uh, this video depends on you having a little bit of understanding beforehand of what an ECG is, but we'll try to do some fundamental review as well. Okay, so we're going to cover in this video calibration, the big three of rate rhythm axis, the different waves and how they can change, you know, PQRST, and then we have the intervals and the segments. So just a quick note on what the difference is between an interval and a segment. If you look here at the PR, for example, the PR interval includes the P wave in its measurement and the PR segment does not. So a way you can remember this is that interval includes and segment segregates the first letter. Another example here, the ST segment, right? It does not include the S wave. So it segregates the first letter. Just a quick note on that. So some basics here on the ECG paper. Um, each ECG paper has these darker red squares, which are bigger, and they're composed of five by five small squares, which have these finer lines, okay? So in order to understand the units of the ECG, we have to really look at the small squares. And then off, off of that, we can just multiply five by five and get the big squares. So let's, take a, let's blow up one of these small squares and really understand our ECG axes. All right, so on the x-axis here, we have time. And then on the y-axis, we have amplitude. All right, so in terms of time, one small square is 40 milliseconds, all right? And in terms of amplitude, a small square is 0.1 millivolts. Now, if we blow that up to a big square, we know that in the, on the x-axis, a big square is 200 milliseconds long, and height is 0.5 millivolts, okay? Another thing about the direct measurements. So sometimes people will measure these big squares and small squares in terms of inches and millimeters. So what you've got to know is that one small square in actual size is one millimeter by one millimeter. And then you can blow it up to five millimeters by five millimeters. And sometimes uh, lengths are measured in millimeters and sometimes they're measured, as you can see here in millivolts if we're on the y-axis and in milliseconds if we're on the x-axis. The whole ECG lasts for about 10 seconds, and you'll see this on the bottom rhythm, rhythm strip. That strip is 10 seconds long. And if we look at the calibration spike, this is found at the beginning of each of the leads, and it should be two big boxes tall and one big box wide. And this is going to tell you that your ECG is calibrated properly and your interpretations are going to be accurate. Let's talk about rate for a second. So rate can be calculated in two main ways. One of them is to look at the RR interval. You can pick any RR interval. So let's say, for example, we pick this R wave and this R wave, and then we look at how many big boxes are found between them. Now, we can see that two big boxes are found between these RR intervals. So we do 300 divided by the large squares in between the RR, so that would be two, and we would get a heart rate of 150 beats per minute. But there's a caveat here. Before doing this analysis, you have to determine if the rate is regular or irregular. And one of the good ways to look at that is to look at the bottom rhythm strip. So here we can see that our RR interval is inconsistent. Here we have about four squares and here we have about two squares. So you can see it's longer and shorter. So in this case, if we have an irregular rate, we wanna look at the rhythm strip, count out the number of R waves, and then multiply that by six. Remember I said the rhythm strip was 10 seconds. So if we multiply by six, we should get a minute. So here we have 102 beats per minute as opposed to 150, which we measured from up here. So first thing you wanna do with rate is determine regularity. And the next thing you can determine the beats per minute, okay? So the heart rhythm, that's gonna tell us if a beat is sinus or not. That's its main purpose. Now, a sinus rhythm starts in the SA node. So right around here and then moves down and to the left, all right? So uh, what's the definition of a sinus rhythm? Now, a lot of people are gonna tell you, oh, that means there's a P before every QRS. Now, while that does happen in most sinus rhythms, that is not the formal definition, and you're gonna have to watch out because the real definition of a sinus rhythm is that the P wave is positive in lead two and negative in AVR, and that makes a lot of sense because the, the electrical potential, that positive potential, is moving down and to the left. So it's going to go positively towards lead two and moves away from AVR. So it's gonna make it negative. 
So if you have these two criteria, you can be pretty sure your beat is sinus. Another criteria to look out for is to see that the P waves are consistent in that lead, so not changing all the time. Here we have an example of a sinus rhythm. So if we use our definition, what are we looking for? We're looking at lead two, and we're looking at AVR. Is it positive in lead two? It is. Is it negative in AVR? Boom, it is. Is it the same and consistent in these leads, not alternating? Yes, so this is a sinus rhythm. So here we have an example of an atrial rhythm. And if you were to use the um, common definition of a P being before every QRS, you might get tripped up. Because look here, we have a P, QRS, P, then a QRS. And then if we look at AVR, we have a P and then a QRS. Right, so you might be tripped up into thinking this is sinus. But if we follow our strict definition, we have to say that the, sin the lead is positive in lead two. So here we have a bimodal P, so we can't say that. And it has to be negative in AVR. And is it negative? It's actually positive. So we do not meet the definition of a sinus rhythm. And we have an isoelectric point to lead one. That means we're going perpendicular, so up and down, right? So it's either this way or it's this way, and you can't really tell. You can't really eliminate any possibilities. You're going to have to use more leads at that point. So let's do an example here. All right. So we have our ECG here over on the left, and we have a positive. We've picked our two leads, right? Lead one and lead AVF, our two classics. And we see that we have a positive deflection in lead one, so we're going this way. And then we have a negative deflection in AVF. Regularly, we expect a positive deflection in AVF, putting us in this quadrant. But if it's negative, we're going the opposite direction. So we're now in this quadrant, okay? And that's going to indicate to us that we might have a normal axis if we're in this range, or we ha might have a left axis deviation if we're going in the top section of this. So we're going to require using more leads. Now it's all right because the axis is usually told to you on the ECG strip. It's calculated by the computer, so you're not going to have to calculate it yourself. And it's more accurate that way because calculating it yourself would require a grid chart and a ruler. So don't worry about uh, determining the exact number. Just be aware that uh, you have to look at lead. Usually have to look at lead one and lead ABF, and if they're both positive, you should be all good with a normal axis. Now we're going to talk about each of the waves in the ECG. We'll start with the P wave. It represents atrial depolarization, and it's the first wave seen. So, uh, P wave dimensions, let's talk about them really quickly. Uh, how long should a P wave be maximally, and how tall should it be maximally before we get concerned? Okay, so P wave should always be this smooth bump, as we see over here on the top left, like a normal P wave. And it should be a maximum of 140 milliseconds wide which means three small boxes, and a maximum of 2.5 millimeters tall, right? Which means two, two and a half small boxes tall. Now, why is this important? A really tall P wave, greater than 2.5 millimeters, could indicate something like a right atrial enlargement. And then if we look at the morphology of P wave, if it has this dimple, it could indicate left atrial enlargement. So we see here the uh, dimple here is more on one side, which is representing the right atrial side, because remember our SA node fires, and then our right atrium gets depolarized first, and if it's thick, it's going to cause this little spiky peak. And then here is our left atrial depolarization just a bit later. Normally it should be smooth, and they should depolarize roughly with the same amount of potential, so it's going to make a smooth bump. But if one is bigger than the other, you're obviously going to get this spike and then this lower spike here. And then if they're left atrium is enlarged, it's going to have its own unique peak, which is seen here, okay? If they're both enlarged, it's not only going to be tall, but you're going to have the tall and bifid structure, okay? So a bifid P wave or a dimpled P wave can indicate left atrial enlargement. Another thing to look out for P waves is that they should always be followed by a QRS complex. If they're not, you could have heart block. And you can tell a beat is sinus by the P waves, right? So if it's positive in lead two and negative in AVR, like we discussed, uh, it's sinus. If it's not, then it's obviously not sinus. Next, we have the Q wave. The Q wave represents depolarization of in the intraventricular septum. 
Now, what this means is uh, this depolarization is actually usually left to right. So that's why it's a negative deflection. If we're looking at something like lead two, which is lead two provides the classic QRS wave, right? And you're gonna see this negative dimple, that's the Q wave. Now in most ECGs, you won't even see the Q wave and it's usually very hard to notice. If you do see a Q wave, it could indicate a pathology. So the dimensions of the Q wave really quickly. A Q wave should be not bigger than one small square and it should be not longer than two small squares. So one small square wide and less than two millimeters tall. If it exceeds these dimensions, then those could be indicate pathological Q waves, okay? And what do pathological Q waves tell you? They tell you that you could have had an MI in the past, okay? And just a quick note about the QRS complex while we're here. Uh, the first negative deflection in the QRS complex is always called Q. Then a positive deflection is always called R, and another negative deflection after the positive deflection is called S. And we'll do some examples just to get a hold of it. Here we have some examples of the nomenclature surrounding the QRS complex. One thing you need to know is that any positive deflection on the QRS is always called R, okay? And any negative deflection before the positive is called Q, and any negative deflection after the positive is called S. So here we have an example of a positive then a negative, so that's an RS. Here we have a negative positive negative, QRS, right? Here we have a negative positive, that's QR. And then let's say we have two positives, then we have RSR. So that's R uh, and an R prime. There's two positive deflections. All positive deflections are labeled R. If the negative comes after a positive, it's labeled S. So I'm sure you're getting the hang of this right now. So here are some examples for you to look at. All right, so we're talking about our QRS complex now. Uh, this is indicating ventricular depolarization, right? And it starts at the beginning of the Q wave and ends at the end of the S wave, which is also called the J point. Now the J point is our return to our isoelectric potential after completion of ventricular depolarization. A little bit about the dimensions of the QRS. It should be no greater than 120 milliseconds wide, which is three small boxes. If it's bigger than 120, we have a wide QRS, okay? This can be caused by the potential being slowed down at some point during conduction through the ventricles, right? So we could have a bundle branch block. We could have a beat that starts in the ventricles, so it's not following our quick conduction system that was built for it. An accessory pathway. An example of this would be Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, where we have the bundle of Kent bypassing the AV node, and that would cause not only our QRS widening, it would also cause our PR interval to be shorter. Okay, because now our uh, potential is bypassing the AV node, so we're getting into our QRS a little earlier. Then let's talk about height. So how tall can a QRS be? And this varies depending on the leads. So these are just some reference values to look at in general, but if you want to be really precise, you have to look up the reference heights for each lead. So generally, a QRS should be bigger than one big box, so around 1.5 millivolts, and smaller than six big boxes, so three millivolts, okay? So five to 30 small boxes tall. If it's below one big box, you could have a low amplitude QRS complex, which could indicate something like an effusion, because now your leads can't detect the electrical potential as well, right? Because there's a bunch of fluid there in the way. If it's taller than six big boxes, for example, you definitely have some left ventricular hypertrophy going on, or something that's enlarging the heart, causing more electricity to pass through it. And a very important caveat here is if the QRS is alternating, so we have one big one, one small one, this tells you that the heart is now bouncing around inside the chest. And this occurs in tamponade, where there's a lot of fluid that builds up very quickly in the pericardium, and it's causing the heart now to shake inside of that fluid which alternates the QRS tall to short because the, our electrode is fixed, but our heart is moving. So watch out for these alternating QRS. They're really only seen in tamponade. And one other thing to realize is if you have a wide QRS complex and you're trying to interpret ST segment elevation, for example, 
which would indicate something like an MI. You have to be careful because sometimes just the widening of the QRS can alter the ST segment as well. So be careful in wide QRS complexes. The ST segment may be elevated as a result of the wide QRS, not as a result of ischemia. And different shapes in the QRS that are not normal for that lead can indicate bundle branch block. The R wave is an important component of our QRS complex, and you can also analyze an ECG uh, and interpret the R wave progression. So what does this mean? Here we have our chest leads, V1 to V6. V1 is on our right side, V6 is on our left side. All right, this is the front of the chest over here. So as we move from V1 to V6, our R wave should become more positive, right? Remember that our electrical potential is moving down and to the left. So we'd expect our R wave amplitude to be highest somewhere in V4 or V5, which is true. If you look at V4 and V5 here, it, the positive deflection is the strongest. And because V1 points away from our main electrical potential, we'd expect the R wave to be negative. So as we're moving from right to left or from V1 to V6, our R wave should gradually go from negative to positive. Okay, so here, here we have negative, net negative. Here it's kind of going half negative, half positive, And this is what we call the transition point. Okay, so our transition point where the R and the S wave are roughly equal is should be seen around V3 or V4, so halfway through, okay? And that's normal. And then we have positive, positive, positive in V4, 5, and 6. If our R wave progression is uh, poor, so we have our transition point somewhere further down the line or way too early, and it doesn't look like it's going properly from negative to positive in a slow transition, we could have an indication of an anomaly, such as an anterior MI. This is similar to how you would see with you know, the Q waves. The Q waves, uh, if they're abnormal or too large, could indicate an MI, could indicate some sort of pathology. So you really can use this as an extra clue in your analysis of the ECG. And finally, we have the T wave. So the T wave represents our repolarization of the ventricles. It should be upright in all the leads, except for maybe AVR and V1. It should also be concordant with the QRS complex, which means that if the QRS complex is mostly pointing upwards, then it'll also point upwards. And if the QRS complex is pointing downwards, it will also point downwards. The only exception to this is V1 and AVR, where the QRS and the T wave don't have to be concordant. So one can point up and the other can point down, and it can be totally normal. And the way you can remember this is that the V1 lead is mostly on the right side of the chest and AVR is the right-sided limb lead. So just remember on the right side, the T wave does not need to match the QRS complex. A little bit about the dimensions of our T wave. The amplitude can range from five millimeters to uh, 10 millimeters, okay? Five millimeters in the limb leads. If it's below that, it's normal. So that's five small squares and 10 millimeters in the precordial leads. So that's 10 small squares or two big boxes. Okay, so that's the V1 to V6 leads. So our amplitude uh, can vary between the leads and still be normal. Then in terms of duration, it should last 100 to 250 milliseconds. That's around 2.5 small boxes to just over one big box. So if it's less than 2.5 small boxes, which is really, really small, or if it's greater than one big box by quite a bit, then you know you have an altered duration in your T wave, okay? If a QRS complex is abnormal, then you can't really trust the T wave to be normal, right? Because if depolarization is abnormal, then repolarization will also be abnormal. So make sure before you look at the T that you've also analyzed the QRS complex and ensured that it is normal, because if it's not, then the T wave is obviously not gonna be normal either. Causes of T wave changes. So we can have ischemia, we can have bundle branch, we can have hypertrophy of the heart. All of these will alter the T wave. Now T wave inversion is something that you are gonna look out for on the ECG, right? As we talked about before, inversion is normal in V1 and AVR, and the T wave should always match the direction of the QRS other than these two leads. It can be normal in V2, as well as leads two, three, and AVF, but it's questionable in these leads, okay? So just watch out for that as well. These can be normal, but just uh, put a little question mark beside them if you're seeing other abnormal changes. 
height of the T wave. Okay, so height of the T wave is going to indicate usually uh, potassium status or an ischemic event. So if it's a tall T wave, right, if it's greater than uh, 5 millimeters, which is one big box, or 10 millimeters in the precordial leads, you can guess that the person might have hyperkalemia. If it's flat or less than those dimensions, right, by a lot, you can indicate hypokalemia. In those cases, the T wave will be flattened out and might be a little longer as well because the repolarization will take some time. You'll also see something called U waves, which are smaller versions of the T waves that happen a little later, and they're just that residual repolarization happening. Okay, and on top of this, you will also get a longer QT interval. So the time between Q and T will also prolong. All right, and again, MI can cause height changes in the T waves as well. Here we have a normal ECG, and what we're going to look at is the T waves. So the T waves should be positive or upward facing in all the leads except for maybe AVR and V1. So if we're looking at the T waves, positive, 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 okay, good. Here in AVR, they're negative. All right, so that makes sense. And you can see it's concordant with the QRS complex. So it can be, or it can be like this, and it'll still be okay. And then AVL, we can't really see anything. Positive T wave in AVF, positive T wave in the precordial leads. And here what you'll notice is that V1 is not concordant, right? The QRS complex is mostly pointing downwards and the T wave is pointing in the opposite direction. Now this is totally normal, right? All right, so then we look at the T waves in the other complexes, positive, good, positive, good, positive, good, positive, good, and positive, good, right? So AVR and V1, we have our negative T waves. Those are totally normal. The rest of the T waves should be pointing upwards and for the most part should be concordant with the general direction of the QRS complex. One of the things that can happen is if you see inversion of the T waves that are not in AVR or V1, you could have a potential indicator for ischemia. Now we're going to talk about our intervals. So let's start off with the PR interval. This represents the electrical signal being conducted from the atria into the ventricles and going through that AV node. And the clinical significance of this is that you can get a heart block or you can get a bypassing of the AV node, which will both show up in the PR interval. So how long should a PR interval be? It should be 120 to 200 milliseconds, okay? How long is that in boxes? Because we have to convert all this to boxes. So 200 is four, five small boxes, right? Uh, which means one big box. Uh, and then 120 is three small boxes. And we know that if it's shorter than 120, that's significant, and if it's greater than 200. So let's take an example here on the bottom. We see our P waves, they're really close to our T, so they're almost fused here. Let's pick a random one. Let's pick this one down here. So I'll circle it for you. Uh, and then we have this P wave right here. Now if we go all the way to the R, we'll see that that's one big box and some change, maybe three small boxes. So we're definitely over our one big box, ma big box max. So this is a heart block. Okay, we have some sort of PR prolongation. Now, if it's shorter than three small boxes, let's say, for example, we have our Wolf Parkinson White example here, where we have the beginning of our R wave somewhere around here, and the start of our P wave somewhere around here. We have about maybe one, two, maybe two and a half, two and a half small boxes for the PR interval, and that's smaller than three. Also, another thing you'll see with Wolf Parkinson White is this classic delta wave where the there's a swooshing up into the R wave, so there's a little slope. It doesn't go straight up like it usually should into a sharp complex. There's a little bit of a delay. And that's because of our bundle of Kent accessory pathway that uh, conducts a signal not through the AV node. Okay, so we mentioned heart blocks, and let's discuss the different types of heart blocks that you can see. Now, there's three degrees one, two, and three, and they all have different characteristics. So let's define them, and I've added a little rhyme in here that helped me remember them, and hopefully it'll help you. So first degree heart block, all P waves conduct through the AV node. So the AV node is not bypassed or blocked, it's just slowed, all right? Slowed past a reasonable degree. So the PR interval is gonna be greater than 200 milliseconds, which is what we discussed before, that's one big square. 
and then we have it being consistently long and the same length PR throughout. So our P and our R are going to have consistent intervals and they're going to be consistently longer than 200. Okay. Then a uh, little rhyme you can use for this is if R is far away from P, then you have a first degree. And two, if we have a second degree heart block, some P waves conduct through the AV node and others fail. Now, the tricky part about second degree blocks is they're subdivided into two types, Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. So, Mobitz type 1, we have our rhyme, longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a Winkenbach. A Winkenbach is another name for a Mobitz type 1 block. This just means that PR interval is becoming longer and longer, and then eventually you'll see a dropped R complex. You'll see a P with no R. And that indicates that we have a Mobitz type 1 second degree block. Then for Mobitz type 2, we have some P's don't get through. Then you have Mobitz type 2. So the PR length is consistent, right? In this one, you might not even have prolongation of the PR interval. So it's consistent, consistent, consistent. And then you have a random dropped P. So they have a random P with no QRS complex, right? And we'll see an example of that shortly. So some P's don't get through. Then you have Mobitz type 2. On this one, the interval might be normal, so just watch out. Then third degree heart blocks, no P waves are conducted through the AV node. So the atria and ventricles are doing their own thing. They're each conducting their own rhythms. So you'll see the P waves and the R waves at inconsistent intervals. So the P's will still happen at consistent intervals and the R's will still happen at consistent intervals. They just won't correspond to each other. They'll be uh, random. So if R's and P don't agree, then you have a third degree. Right? PR interval is random. P and QRS occur at their set intervals but do not correlate. Let's go through our rhymes again. R is far away from P, then you have a first degree. Longer, longer, longer drop, then you have a Winkenbach. Some P's don't get through, then you have Mobitz type 2. If R and P's don't agree, then you have a third degree. And I hope those little rhymes helped you. So here are our examples of our different degrees of R block. Uh, so here's first degree. You'll see that the PR interval is quite prolonged. It's almost two big boxes from the beginning of P to the beginning of R. We have greater than one big box. And you'll see that it's consistently long, right? It's consistently the same length. So if R is far away from P, then you have a first degree. So that's our little rhyme for first degree block. Then second degree AV block Mobitz type 1, also known as Winkenbach. This is a second degree block. And the thing you'll remember for all our second degree blocks is sometimes the P waves don't get through our AV node. So we will have the dropping of an R complex, right? In first degree block, all the P's were conducted. They were just, our AV node was just a little bit slow. But in the second degree block, our, our P waves got fully blocked and couldn't go through at some point, right? So some P's did not conduct. Okay, so what's our rhyme for Mobitz type one or Winkenbach? We have longer, longer, longer drop, then we have a winking box. So it gets longer, it gets longer, it gets longer, and boom, we're missing an R complex. Winking box. Okay. You'll see that here it originally started out close to normal, right? Almost one big box. So watch out because you might get a normal PR interval once in a while with these. But you'll you'll definitely get one prolonged one or a drop beat. And that is most true here in our second degree block, right? If uh, R is randomly dropped, then we have a Mobitz type 2. So you'll see our PR interval is less than one big box, so it's normal. But then we have a random block here, right? So that's our Mobitz type 2 second degree block, where one of our P's are dropped. Then our second degree AV block 2 to 1 block. So this is another example where two P's are required to conduct one R, right? So this 2 to 1 tells you the ratio of P to R. So here, we see two P waves and then one R wave. And that just indicates the ratio of P to R and how many, so for each P, only every other P gets conducted through the AV node. And then if R and P don't agree, then you have a type three, right? So here we see our R waves are consistent and they're the same distance from each other. Now, if we look for our P waves, okay, Boom, there we have a P wave. Boom, there we have a P wave. But they don't seem to be conducting. And then boom, there we have a P wave. So the P waves are consistent intervals from each other also. 
but they're not conducting with respect to the QRS complexes, so they're doing their own thing. R and P don't agree. The QT interval represents the depolarization and repolarization of the ventricles. So this interval starts at the Q wave, at the beginning of the Q wave, and goes all the way till the end of the T wave. Now, the important thing to notice about the QT interval is usually you don't talk about QT when you're talking about an ECG, you talk about QTC. Why? Because QT intervals vary with heart rate. So in order to standardize this, we have to account for the heart rate. And how this is done is by calculating the QTC, which is the QT interval divided by the square root of the RR interval. And that way you can calculate QTC. Now, QTC is prolonged when it's greater than 440 milliseconds in men or 460 milliseconds in women. So just watch out for this 440 number. It usually pops up. Um, and if we think about that in terms of small boxes, it's uh, about 11 small boxes or two big boxes in a little bit. Okay. So usually you'll look around to see this 440 max 460 number. If you're 500 and over, you're definitely too long and you have a risk of torsades because a prolonged QT, if it goes unchecked, can lead into torsades. Okay. QT, uh, as a general rule, should be less than half of the previous RR interval if you don't want to use this uh, QTC rule and then calculate it. So if you're on a late night call, uh, just looking at the QT as being a little less than half or less than half of the previous RR should be a fine approximation. So let's talk about long QT and what are some of the potential causes. So long QT, 440 milliseconds is our generalized cutoff. And that's about a little bigger than two big boxes, right? So here we're, we're within our cutoff. We see about two big boxes. And here on the right, we've definitely exceeded it. We're hitting almost three big boxes in terms of length, okay? So what are the potential causes of our long QT? And remember, we're not talking about QT, we're talking about QTC, because you always want to go based on the corrected QT. So we have low potassium, low magnesium, low calcium, low temperature, low thyroid. So long is for low, all right? So the L's match. These are low electrolyte states. And then low temperature and low thyroid, they can sometimes go hand in hand, right? Other causes of long QT include myocardial ischemia, so return of spontaneous circulation or ROSC post-cardiac arrest can cause this. Then we have inc increased intracranial pressure. Um, and we have potential congenital causes. An example here is Romano Ward syndrome, which we can cover in a separate video. Then on top of this, we have uh, induced long QT, which is caused by drugs. In here, we have antipsychotics. Antiarrhythmics can cause this type, A1, A1, C, and 3. Antidepressants, some SSRIs can cause this, SNRIs, bupropion, and definitely TCAs, watch out for this. Antihistamines can cause this, antimalarials like chloroquine can cause this, and macrolides, watch out for that one as well. So these are, these are all common drugs associated with prolonged QT. So how about short QT? Well, the short QT cutoff is less than 350 milliseconds which is about one and a half big boxes, any shorter than that, and you're in short QT range. Remember this is QTC as well. So causes of this include high potassium, calcium, high temperature like a fever, and high thyroid states. And this can be congenital, and the main drug to look out for here is digoxin. Now that's just digoxin use. This is different from digoxin toxicity. Okay, so just using digoxin normally shortens the QT interval. And you'll get this ST depression called the Salvador Dali sagging appearance. So you see here on the bottom left, the ST kind of depresses in the same shape as Salvador Dali's mustache. All right, so you'll get shortened QT, ST depression. On top of that, you can also get increased vagal effects on the AV node causing a prolonged PR interval. So three effects of normal digoxin use, short QT, ST sag sagging and PR uh, lengthening, okay? And if you go into toxicity territory, you're gonna have those systemic effects such as blurring vision, yellow haze, nausea, vomiting, right? And you'll get supraventricular tachycardia, a slow ventricular response, and you'll often see a lot of PVCs, 
and potentially waves that aren't conducted. So you might see dropped beats if you've ventured into digoxin use toxicity, but we'll cover that in a later video on digoxin. Finally, we're going to talk about the ST segment. The ST segment starts from the end of the S wave to the beginning of the T wave, and it represents the interval between depolarization and repolarization of ventricles, depolarization in the QRS and repolarization in the T wave. Now, the ST segment can undergo a lot of changes. It can be elevated, it can be depressed, and each of those has their own individual meaning. And the reason why clinically the ST segment is important is mainly because it helps us identify myocardial infarctions or ischemia. But there are also some other pathologies to look out for, for example, pericarditis, left bundle branch block, left ventricular hypertrophy, and early repolarization can also all be detected in the ST segment. All right, so we're hopping into ST elevation and we'll cover depression next. So ST segment elevation is our main indicator for myocardial infarction or ischemia in the heart. Now, it depends on the lead you're in because that's gonna de define our criteria for what an elevation means. If you're in a limb lead, you have to have greater than 0.1 millivolt elevation. And if you're in a precordial lead, you have to have a greater than 0.2 millivolt elevation. So that's one small square here and two small squares in the precordial leads. Let's take our example here on the right. If we have an elevation of 1.5 millimeters or 1.5 small squares or 1.5 millivolts, does this classify for an ST elevation in the precordial leads? No, but it does classify in the limb leads. So be careful which lead you're looking at and how high this elevation is. Next, in order to identify a myocardial infarction, you have to have this elevation in greater than two anatomically contiguous leads. So these leads are usually in order on the ECG, and for example, V1 and V2 are contiguous leads. Then, um, based on where these ST elevations are found, you can tell kind of which coronary artery is occluded. So I've included the examples here for lateral MI, anterior and inferior, and which leads to look out for, okay? We're, cover, we're going to cover this more in depth in our myocardial uh, infarction ECG video, but these are just for your reference here in case you wanted to review them quickly. Another thing that's important to look at is the um, if, if the ST elevations are elevated throughout, this could indicate something like a pericarditis. And I want to introduce the, sh the concept of the shape of the ST elevation uh, here because it's also important. So ST elevations can be concave or convex. A concave elevation looks like a smiley face, so it dips into the chart, and a convex elevation looks kind of like a frowny face. Now, if it's concave, it could indicate pericarditis or early repolarization. This is a totally benign finding found in young men that exercise a lot. You have a more rapid phase one of myocardial uh, repolarization, so they're going to get this little bit of ST elevation. But in convex, uh, convex, that's more likely to vex you, so uh, you are really identifying MIs with this, this kind of shape pattern. Okay. Then another thing to consider when looking at ST elevation, if you have an F L left bundle branch block, and more, we'll talk about bundle branch blocks in one of our future videos on ECG. But if a left bundle branch block is present, you cannot diagnose an MI in the presence of ST elevation. Okay, so be careful for this. Uh, left bundle branch blocks can affect repolarization abnormalities, and therefore you cannot be sure that it's an MI based on the ECG if an LBBB is present. All right, so as we said before, small concave ST elevations can be a normal finding in young healthy men due to early repolarization. Another thing to look out for is something called Brugada pattern. This is a congenital sodium channel defect. We're also gonna cover this in a future video on uh, ECG abnormalities to look out for. Uh, basically the summary is that these people have ST segment elevations um, and they often suffer from sudden cardiac death. So it's very important to diagnose this with an ECG as early as possible. Now hopping into ST depressions, which are also clinically significant. So ST depressions are identified as the same criteria as ST elevations. So a decrease in one or two small squares based on leads you're in. And the differential diagnosis here varies. So we could have a non-ST elevation MI causing ST depression. That's where not the entire thickness of the myocardium is affected, but only partially. We could have a sign of coronary artery disease presenting as ST depression. We could have an old MI presenting this way. Ventricular hypertrophy is kind of interesting because 
you have ST depression and uh, T wave inversion in specific leads. So whether it's right or left, you can determine by where the T waves are inverted. So if it's in V4 to V6, you have a left ventricular hypertrophy with ST depressions, and V1 to 4, you could have a right ventricular hypertrophy. A digoxin effect we talked about uh, before, and we have that Salvador Dali sign. Hypokalemia and left bundle branch block can also cause ST depressions. Now the shape of the depression also matters because just like with ST elevation, ST depression has its own group of shapes. We have downsloping, upsloping, horizontal, and sagging. So uh, let's talk about downsloping and horizontal first because these are our dangerous boys. Okay. So if we have these, these are the most indicative of myocardial ischemia. Then if we have an upsloping ST depression, this may be normal, but if it gets really, really bad, then we could have a sign of coronary artery disease being manifested. So that's this one here. See how it's kind of sloping upwards? And the sagging one is our Salvador Dali sign, which you can see with people who are taking digoxin. So this is, concludes the end of our ECG uh, video. Uh, in the next video series, we're going to talk about myocardial infarctions and different pathologies that are detected by ECG. And I'm going to make them their own separate sections or else this video would be three hours long. So I'll create a playlist. Feel free to watch those videos as you see fit. This is just an introduction about the different waves and the different segments on ECG. I hope it was helpful and I'll see you in the next video.